Since this is the 25th birthday, I thought we'd talk about the origin and the early years of the Mises Institute because uh, I've been there from almost the very uh, start of the uh, Institute in 1982. Uh, this will necessarily be an abbreviated uh, version because of the time limitations, but and I'm sure many people are going to be left out, but I do think it's important to know exactly how uh, Lou Rockwell came to create the Institute and some of the original people that were involved in it. Of course, everyone here tonight is responsible for the great success it's had over the years, and uh, I'm going to cut this off with just the origin of the Institute. But 15 years ago here in New York, uh, we were celebrating the 10th anniversary, and Lou uh, gave me a uh, plaque uh, commemorating the fact that I was one of the founders of the Institute, which I've always valued and kept on my wall. But really, in fact, there's only one founder of the Institute, and that's Lou Rockwell. Two of the uh, most important and earliest uh, people to the Institute, of course, were Margaret von Mises and Murray Rothbard. Uh, very briefly, let me recite some of the background of Lou and how he came to know the people to put it all together. Lou was a uh, senior editor of Arlington House Publishers, one of the great publishers of uh, conservative, classical liberal, and libertarian lib literature. Unfortunately, uh, they're no longer in business. But Lou held a position uh, in the late 60s and was one of, the, one of his assignments was to serve as editor for the works of Ludwig von Mises and Henry Hazlitt. And in this connection, he spent most of his time uh, involved with the works of Ludwig von Mises. Um, it was his emphasis on Mises that led him to uh, request having a dinner in New York with Ludwig von Mises and Mrs. Mises. And so they met here and uh, discussed his work, and this was in 1968. Uh, this meeting, of course, will prove to be very important later to the creation of the Mises Institute. Also, uh, his editorship uh, was for Henry Hazlitt, and of course he met Hazlitt, and again, this proved later to be important to the Mises Institute. After Arlington House, uh, Lou... Uh, uh, became connected with Hillsdale College and was in charge of their, uh, 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 their ideological activities and papers. And the college is justly famous for the fact it did not accept any government funding. And following Hillsdale, Lou became chief of staff for Congressman Ron Paul in the late 70s. And, and again, you can see uh, that, that proved very beneficial to the Institute later. But for some time after the death of Ludwig von Mises in 1973, Lou became concerned that Mises' ideas and his works would not get the attention that they deserved and that some volumes might go out of print. So in 1982, Lou made an appointment to come to New York and meet with Margaret von Mises. And uh, she, they knew each other, of course, from the dinner meeting previously. Uh, he, she gave him her consent to uh, start the Institute only if, uh, and she would support it, she gave her commitment to support it, only if he would first give her his personal commitment that he would devote the rest of his life to promoting the Institute and Ludwig von Mises' ideas, and Lou made that commitment to her. This was a very risky commitment on his part because at that time it was just him and he had no contributors, uh, no one to help him and immediately he first turned to Murray Rothbard and uh, got Murray's uh, commitment to uh, serve with the Institute and uh, Lou uh, got his commitment to be the academic advisor and then uh, Lou became president and Murray became vice president. Um, Lou began talking with various people to try to get support, and there were uh, a lot of people that tried to discourage him from creating the Mises Institute because they said that Ludwig von Mises was just too uncompromising. Uh, to me, one of the endearing uh, commitments or parts of Ludwig von Mises was his integrity and his courage to stand by his principles and be uncompromising when others 
did compromise and uh, gave up on their ideas. So I think that's one of the great uh, commitments that uh, uh, Larry Von Mises had was to stay true to his principles. Um, Lou recognized that he needed the, uh, to establish a commitment uh, with a connection to a, a major university and an economics department to get the thing started. Uh, he uh, wanted, of course, to have an economics department that was at least sympathetic to free market ideas, but hopefully have some sort of connection to Austrian economics. And as you can imagine, at that time, uh, there were the, uh, not many possibilities. But after considering uh, all of the possibilities, he decided on Auburn University. Lou had learned that they, uh, Auburn University had a, an outstanding faculty of free market economists that had been carefully put together by a department head uh, over a period of about 20 years. And he had actually met uh, one member of that faculty, uh, Roger Garrison, who was not only sympathetic to Austrian economics, but very much in favor of Ludwig von Mises' ideas. Lou also uh, had a commitment, uh, one of his earliest financial commitments for, for, from Catherine Dixon Rowland, uh, whose family uh, lived in Alabama, and they were very uh, strong supporters of Auburn University, and she uh, strongly encouraged Lou to come to Auburn University. Lou also uh, learned from a person named Marsha Friedman, who uh, I think she was invited to be here. I don't know if she's here tonight. Is Marsha Friedman here? Uh, she had been with the Cato Institute, and I had uh, met her in 1980, and uh, she uh, recommended uh, me to Lou that I was a trustee of Auburn University, that uh, I was not only uh, sympathetic to libertarian ideas, but actually to Austrian economic ideas and the ideas of uh, Ludwig von Mises. So uh, Lou contacted me in 1982 and uh, got a call from Lou, and I've often thought uh, about the excitement I had at that time is comparable to what uh, Henry Hazlitt used to uh, talk about. That he answered the phone and the voice on the other side said, this is Ludwig von Mises. I'm here in New York. I'd like to talk to you. And, uh, of course, Henry Hazlitt had been uh, talking about Mises and his work for some time, and uh, they had that meeting. But Lou came to my house uh, in 1982, and we had a <clears throat> long conversation about what his dreams were for the Institute, what uh, he thought the Institute could do for the University, and what I thought the University could do uh, for the Institute. So following that, I met with the uh, president of Auburn University and uh, got his commitment to uh, enter into a contract uh, with the uh, Ludwig von Mises Institute to give them space. And uh, then I took that uh, matter to the Board of Trustees. And... Uh, uh, in presenting this to the Board of Trustees, they wanted to know what this institute was, and I told them it was for free market economics. And I remember one member of the board uh, said, well, I, I'm, I'm fully in support of free market economics, as long as you don't impose it on the field of agriculture where I have some investment. <laughs> he said, uh, I'm, uh, I'm fully satisfied with the subsidies from the federal government. I said, we'll, we'll leave you alone. Uh, so, uh, very briefly, uh, tell you a little bit about my background at that point. I was a refugee from the political system. Uh, I had been very active in the Republican Party. Uh, I had been an alternate delegate to the Republican Convention in 68 and a delegate uh, to the National Republican Convention in 1972. And I uh, gave up on the Republicans with Richard Nixon at that point tried the Libertarian Party. I was a delegate to the 76th Convention and the uh, 1980 Convention, which uh, occurred really in 1979. And uh, a friend, a close friend of mine, had been elected governor of Alabama in 1978, and I had told him that I was uh, uh, through with politics, that uh, I thought the way to promote the ideas of freedom and the uh, free market economic system was through education and that that's what I wanted to do. So he appointed me to the Board of Trustees in uh, 1980. And it was in that year also that I went to a conference uh, in, uh, at Dartmouth uh, College that Cato had put on. And uh, I was interested in that because I, I thought that that was the right way to go, to have some institute that would uh, promote education and ideas. And uh, 
One thing that attracted me about that, at that time, Murray Rothbard was connected with Cato, and uh, he had actually, I think, suggested the name of uh, Cato to them. And uh, that was part of what I had been reading, was the correspondence of John Adams uh, to Jefferson and others to the effect that the American Revolution did not begin in 1775. It began many years before in the hearts and minds of the American people due to what they had read in the pamphlets and the newspapers from Cato's letters by Trenchard and Gordon and the uh, ideas of John Locke. So that was what I thought the way to go was. And uh, so when I went to the Cato conference, uh, I wanted to see how they ran things. And also, I wanted to go hear Ralph Rako speak on World War I. Uh, tell you a little bit about the facilities at Auburn. Some of you may have visited, but I don't think many of you came to the first facility. The, uh, uh, Auburn immediately gave Lou a place to, uh, uh, to have, and it was in the basement of a thatch hall, a, a classroom biz, uh, building. Lou only had two employees, but he was uh, in a very, very small room in the basement, and uh, it not too attractive and not very impressive. But after a time, we got the, a new president, and uh, he uh, provided a small building uh, that was actually literally in the shadows of the football stadium. And it was very small, but I think Lou had about uh, four employees at that time. But uh, after some time, that same president uh, gave me a commitment that the institute would have the best facilities possible. So they built a new uh, business school, and I met with the architect and told him what all the institute needed. And uh, when they built this beautiful building, the uh, Mises Institute had the, uh, the prime spot just as you go in to the right. He had about eight employees at that time, had access to conference rooms, uh, classrooms, and it was a, a really a great facility. Uh, from the beginning, uh, Lou and I had agreed that uh, uh, the Institute would make donations to the Economics Department, uh, not to the University generally, but just to the Economics Department. And uh, Lou did that in lieu of any rent. And even though today there's no official connection with the University, uh, the Mises Institute still makes donations to the Economics Department. Near the end of my last term on the Board of Trustees in 1999, uh, I advised Lou that I thought that he should investigate the possibility of becoming independent from the university and get his own facilities. And so he began to look, and uh, he found a uh, piece of property uh, just across the street from the university, about a block away from the business school. And I don't know how many of you have been to the uh, facility recently, but it's a state-of-the-art facility built with contributions from many of you that are here that is the, uh, it's, uh, it's world famous. People are all of, I, uh, I don't know if any of you read the uh, article in the Wall Street Journal about the Mises Institute, but it's, uh, it's an impressive facility. And Lou now has the uh, apartments back of there that are available for the uh, students and visiting professors. So it's, it's almost a whole block now. So it's a long way from that little bitty uh, basement classroom up to uh, what uh, is there today. Uh, I think it's. I think it would be interesting to you to ho uh, hear who the first board of directors or board of advisors were. Uh, let, uh, Mrs. Mises, of course, was the chairman. I was vice chairman. But uh, one of the, the other four uh, very prominent people, uh, and the first, uh, Frederick Hayek, uh, who is a, had been a student of Mises. Uh, it was a Nobel Prize winner in economics in 1974, the year after Mises died. As you know, he was the author of uh, Road to Serfdom, which was condensed in Reader's Digest and became it really popularized the uh, free market ideas in one of the first books I read uh, about Austrian economics and uh, uh, libertarian ideas. Uh, secondly, there was a, a member of Congress by the name of Ron Paul, who uh, is... Uh, is obviously the most qualified person to be uh, President of the United States is running this year. And, uh, if this was a world, world of perfect justice, he would be elected. Uh, Ron assumed the position also at the uh, very beginning to be uh, called the Distinguished Counselor, which is a uh, position he still maintains. Ron has been uh, 
uh, very active in fundraising for the Institute. Uh, he's been a, a, a wonderful advisor. He comes to the meetings in Auburn uh, often. And, of course, he was a featured speaker here today. Uh, I want to insert one little footnote here that I think is extremely important that you probably will not see anywhere else in any of the media about Ron Paul. Uh, and you won't see it in the minutes of the Congressional Committee by the name of the International Relations Committee. But this event occurred at a meeting of this committee in October 2002, a full five months before the invasion of Iraq. Republican Congressman and uh, Committee Chairman Henry Hyde of Illinois had a discussion with Congressman Ron Paul uh, to the effect that Ron stated he knew that the administration was moving towards initiating military action against Iraq. And Ron announced he was uh, planning to make a motion that Congress declare war against Iraq, and then he would immediately vote against it. Uh, he said he was opposed to going to war without a declaration of war which the Constitution clearly required. Ron's position was that it was a violation of the separation of powers for Congress simply to delegate that power to the President. And he said that there needed to be a, a debate, there needed to be a resolution, and uh, he intended to vote against it. Henry Hyde, uh, the chairman, uh, responded by stating the following, and it's important to listen to this uh, and what this, what this means. He, here's the, here are the words of Henry Hyde. Quote, there are things in the Constitution that have been overtaken by events, by time. The declaration of war is one of those. There are things that are no longer relevant to a modern society. We're just telling the President, use your own discretion and judgment about the war. End quote. Uh, think what that means. Uh, that's a congressman who's sworn to uphold the Constitution and just saying without an amendment, we ignore him. Uh, that part of the Constitution. He asked Ron not to, uh, to offer the resolution because, quote, it would be inappropriate. It would be anachronistic. It just isn't done anymore. End quote. It's my understanding that Congressman Hyde had all that removed from the minutes of that committee meeting so that the public would not be able to see how the flagrant uh, a, a violation of the Constitution that was taking place. And as you know, Congress has not declared war since December 1941. And since 1945, over 400,000 American servicemen and women have been casualties, that is, dead and wounded, in undeclared unconstitutional wars uh, since that time. Think what it would be if, uh, like if Ron Paul was president. Almost daily you would have vetoes coming out of the Oval Office. <laughs> You'd have radio... You'd have radio and TV coverage every day of his speeches to the American people on the benefits of a free market economy, honest money backed by gold, a non-interventionist foreign policy and the need for Congress uh, and the President and the Supreme Court to follow the Constitution in the future. Ron Paul could truly make a difference as President. Now, continuing with the other... Uh, Four other, uh, t the remaining two uh, advisors to the Mises Institute. Uh, the other was Henry Hazlitt, and of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Lou had come in contact with uh, Henry Hazlitt through uh, uh, being in Arlington House. <clears throat> it was Hazlitt's book entitled Economics in One Lesson that I read in 1961, which started me on the road to the ideas of Mises and the Austrian economics in general. Uh, he had been one of the most outstanding promoters of the ideas of Mises from the beginning through his editorials in the New York Times and his articles in Newsweek magazine. Uh, he wrote so well that people like me that were not trained in economics could understand what he was talking about. And uh, that was true for so many other people. Um, he continued to be an outstanding supporter of the Institute. And uh, several years ago, uh, we, the Institute gave him a birthday party are here in New York. And finally, at his death, he left a sizable portion of his estate for the support of the Mises Institute. Finally, the sixth member of the Board of Advisors was Professor Hans Schenholz, who died in June of this year. He was the first student of Mises uh, in the United States to write a dissertation and receive a PhD under the guidance of Ludwig von Mises. He was a longtime professor at Grove City College 
and was primarily responsible for that college acquiring Mises' papers where they are now a guarded treasure. Dr. Shenholz was the 2004 recipient of the Gary Slarbon Prize for a Lifetime Defense of Liberty, uh, which is the highest honor that the Mises Institute bestows on anyone. I can't uh, leave without making just one brief comment about the, uh, the cost of war. During the first 15 years <coughs> of the Institute, Lou and I probably had lunch together uh, at least twice a week. Uh, talking about uh, what was going on, what the problems were, and uh, what the plans were. And when the Soviet Union fell, uh, in one of those conversations, probably in about 1999, I told Lou that this would be a small uh, window of opportunity uh, to talk about war, and, uh, and so that there was a time of peace when uh, people might listen to some criticism about war. And uh, I suggested that a book be written by the Institute called The Cost of War, America's Pyrrhic Victories, which would show that, uh, that Americans had primarily lost their freedom in winning wars, and that it was only, that it was only one time that uh, there had been massive uh, transfer of power to uh, the federal government in the absence of war, and that was during the time of the Great Depression and the New Deal of Roosevelt. Lou liked the idea generally, but he said he thought we ought to have a conference first, and uh, then uh, I would be editor and uh, invite people to submit articles uh, to the book. So we had that uh, conference in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1994. <clears throat> One of my main memories of that is the excitement and, uh, and joy of Murray Rothbard. Uh, he's known as a joyous libertarian, but I can see him now. He's just almost bouncing in his chair. He was so happy during that conference, and uh, he participated in that and submitted uh, two papers to that book. Uh, that book is frequently cited today even uh, uh, in books that one of the, one good book today, The Empire Has No Clothes, uh, U.S. Foreign Policy Exposed by Ivan Elon, I noticed, uh, cites the book 14 times in the, the footnotes. Uh, <clears throat> I want to commend Lou for the courage he showed in taking the stand, the anti-war stand that uh, it took at that time, because there are a lot of people that uh, consider any opposition to war to be uh, unpatriotic. And a lot of contributors and supporters of the Mises Institute uh, may have felt that way. So it was a bold stand for him to take, but I think it's one that Ludwig von Mises would have taken. Uh, in this short time, I've tried to cover just a, a brief sketch of the early part of uh, the Institute, and I've had to leave out a lot of people. Uh, there were a lot of people also in the beginning, Bert Blumert being one, that uh, is very important from the beginning. <laughs> so in conclusion, I want to take this opportunity, and I hope you'll join with me, in thanking Lou Rockwell for his courage, his integrity, his entrepreneurship, his uh, commitment to Mrs. Mises, and for creating the Mises Institute.